Welcome to Voices of Experience. In our long-running program, we have addressed many public policy issues with a wide variety of guests. Today, we'll be discussing some critical federal policy issues facing voters before they go to the polls in November. I'm Dan Michael, President Emeritus of the Minnesota State Retiree Council, AFL-CIO, and I will serve as host of today's program. Joining us today is a person well-versed in public policy issues. Mike Obermuller is a former member of the Minnesota State Legislature and a candidate for public office. Mike Obermuller, welcome to Voices of Experience. Dan, thanks so much for having me on today. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to talk. Okay, let's start with the subject of reapportionment. Uh, what exactly is reapportionment? Well, as you know, the, the Constitution requires us to have uh, representation in our federal government on a, on a, a per capita ba in a, a basis that essentially uh, matches so everybody has equal representation. And uh, so we've got to make sure we've got balanced districts so that some districts don't have a million people while other districts only have a couple hundred thousand people. And so the process is essentially to make sure that we've got equal representation in, in Washington. And that's why we have the U.S. Census every 10 years? Every 10 years. We have to balance that back out again to make sure that we've got a, a true balance in each of these districts so that there's roughly the same number of people being represented by each representative in Congress. So that's why we're in this 2012 election, you know, it's a rebalancing Coming off, coming off of the uh, 2010 census. Right. Okay. Uh, in that 2010 census, uh, uh, did the state of Minnesota gain or lose members in the House of Representatives, or did we stay the same? Well, fortunately, we stayed the same. We were at risk, as you may know, of, of losing a spot. Uh, just a couple thousand votes decided that issue, but we were able to maintain our eight spots, uh, which is uh, crucial, I think, to making sure that we have the representation we need in D.C. So what, what difference does it really make if there are eight or seven? Well, certainly the number of voices there uh, being advocates for our positions uh, are important for us. Uh, but also it has, it has to do with federal funding as well. Dollars that come back into our state are sometimes linked to the number of Congress people in, in the Congress uh, representing your state. So it's important for the, on the funding side, but most importantly on the voices side. Uh, now you live in the new 2nd District of Minnesota. Uh, what or where is the is the new 2nd District of Minnesota. Sure, the 2nd is essentially the South Metro area. Um, it's got four counties, Goodhue, Scott, Wabasha, and Dakota. Um, it goes all the way down to Northfield on the south, and actually Plainview is even a little bit farther south over oh, really? there in Wabasha County. Uh, all the way over to the uh, eastern border with, with the river with, with Wisconsin. Um, and so Red Wing, for example, is in, is in the district in Wabasha. Uh, and then all the way over into Scott County. So places like Valley Fair would be in our district as well. Okay, and I'm in South St. Paul. Thankfully, uh, we do end up some new areas there. Yeah, so you have South St. Paul and West, West St. Paul are, 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 new, are new in the 2nd Congressional District. They are indeed, as, as well as Mendota Heights, who's come in there. And it's about 60,000 voters from what used to be in uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum's district. Okay, so let's, let's turn to some of these critical issues uh, that are affecting people in the United States and the state of Minnesota and the 2nd Congressional District. Uh, for, for retirees, you know, Social, Social Security and Medicare, are issues of special importance. Let's start with Social Security. Uh, why was Social Security established some 77 years ago? Well, I think it's fair to say that there were people with some foresight about what we were going to need for financial security for seniors down the line. Um, I mean, you're obviously, it's an important issue to retirees, but it's hugely important, frankly, to everybody in our country, up and down the line, whether you're young or old now, if those programs are there, uh, we want to have them. And it's, it's essentially to make sure that we've got financial security for folks as they, as they age. So as we age, we are growing old with some dignity. Uh, <laughs> and uh, is, is, is Social Security uh, a government handout program? Well, uh, or, you know, that people are getting something for nothing <laughs> just by virtue of being old? No, actually the program is funded essentially by ourselves. I mean, we, this is a promise that we've made to our seniors and to our the younger folks in the area. And um, it actually uh, is funded by, you know, people who are working, paying into the system primarily, and uh, then collecting back out when they get older and they need that, uh, that, those funds to live on. I remember being 16 or 17 and getting my first Social Security card, or my only Social Security card, <laughs> I should say, and, uh, and uh, seeing some money taken out. And, and my father said, you'll be happy about that sometime. Right. And uh, so we have paid for Social Security, we being people who are now collecting from it. This is something we have paid into 
for all of our working lives. And uh, now, now we're draw, drawing back. Right. And in fact, that's one of the things that's, uh, I think, concerning about some of the folks who are, you know, essentially planning to try to undercut that system. There are folks like my opponent, John Klein, who uh, has been a cheerleader for privatizing Social Security. And I think you can probably imagine over the last couple of years with the, with the market going up and down, you yeah. wouldn't want to be riding the, the private uh, market for those rather than the security that we've got from a good, solid Social Security system. Yeah. Social Security has never, ever missed a monthly payment to, to its retirees, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. So uh, there, there's a cap on Social Security uh, earnings. Uh, could you explain the concept of, of, of the cap? Of the cap? Sure. That, that cap refers to the, the number of dollars that you have to earn uh, while you still pay the tax into the system. And as, as you come to a certain uh, dollar figure, I think it's about $116,000 now, um, then you stop paying the Social Security tax. You also stop getting the benefits that go uh, above and beyond that. I think the thinking was originally that uh, you know if you got if you were making consistently 116 plus thousand dollars a year or whatever the number was um, historically, uh, that you probably were not going to rely exclusively on Social Security. But it is important to have that sa safety net there for everyone, and that's why privatization of it would have been so so much of a concern. So if I'm a person who's making two hundred thousand dollars a year. I'm only paying taxes on the first 116,000. Right. And the, and the other part is is tax free as far as social security is concerned. Right, you're not you're not paying taxes on amount and it, it doesn't matter whether you're making 250 or if you're making 2 million or 3 million dollars in earned income. Um, if those dollars are uh, are coming from your wages, uh, you're not paying taxes anything above that 116,000 or whatever that number exactly is. Now back in 1935 when social security was established under President Franklin Roosevelt What's the, what's the cap, 116,000? No, it would have been lower, of course, uh, as we've had, we have had some jumps up. It hasn't actually matched uh, inflation, obviously, with, with things, but uh, it, we have, uh, we've not, that cap hasn't kept pace with things. And, and there are some who would talk about actually removing that cap and, and letting uh, folks pay that tax up as a way of kind of supporting the system a little bit more. So, yeah, what, what would happen then if the cap were lifted? Well, obviously, more money then would come into the Social Security system. Uh, it would make sure that there were more dollars around for the benefits that would go. Uh, the concern, of course, I would have with that is that uh, we've had a Congress who seems uh, enthused about going and finding any pot of money that might be sitting around and spending it on things. And we've got to make sure we don't let that happen. And, I mean, those dollars ought to be dedicated for that single purpose. Um, and so if there's any changes to the way we collect the dollars, we have to make more. It's most important to make sure we're not letting that money go off to some other purpose. The phrase lockbox comes to mind. <laughs> right. And that's, you know, it's, it's just, it's, we've got to make sure that we, when we make a commitment like this, we've got the funds to do it. And making sure that system is solvent going forward is cru crucial to the success of our country. Okay. Medicare was, was added in 1965. And thank you, Hubert Humphrey, <laughs> uh, for having the vision uh, to see the need for, for health care coverage. And uh, that was one of his longstanding issues when he was in the U.S. Senate. And, uh, uh, we can speak from experience. Uh, you know, the more we age, uh, the more often we need to use the medical system. Uh, so how is Medicare funded? Well, Medicare is primarily funded also out of payroll taxes. There's a special tax that is done for that. Um, there are a few other uh, revenue streams for it, but the primary money comes out of money that we have earned from our employers that is then ultimately used and collected and, and there to help pay for folks who are, who are sick when they're older. Okay. Now, what uh, extreme, extreme, extreme change in Medicare is planned under the terms of the Paul Ryan uh, budget? Yeah, well, the, the system that the current, uh, bu the Ryan budget, and I think what uh, uh, Governor Romney is trying to do in, in his system as well, would essentially end Medicare as we know it. The current system is you, you, you get a chance to have that security of knowing you got health coverage once you turn 65 and you're moving forward. Their system would essentially turn it into a voucher program, so that if you, you'd get a voucher to go out and buy insurance somewhere else. Now, that may sound like, you know, kind of at first blush, well, I'll just go out and have my choice. The problem is, if the voucher, if you're really sick, the voucher might not be enough to pay for that insurance. Uh, or you might not be able to find insurance with the right kinds of coverage for you. Uh, that makes it pretty risky and, and it kind of defeats the whole purpose of this program, which was to make sure that everyone had coverage in their old age, to make sure they had access to health care that they needed. Now, I can recall in the not too distant past, uh, President George W. Bush wanted to privatize Social Security. And he made a series of stops around the country uh, to explain privatization of Social Security. 
and uh, every time he went someplace, uh, the polling numbers uh, went down <laughs> because people didn't want Social Security privatized. So, so now we have an attempt here with the uh, Paul Ryan plan, the Paul Ryan budget to privatize Medicare and uh, in, in a very similar way. Yeah, and, and I think as people hear about this and 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 think think about it, uh, you realize this is not this is not uh, something that most people would want to go to. Yeah, and Dan, we we have to protect this these programs for our seniors. I mean, that's one of the big problems with folks like Congressman Klein, who I'm running against, uh, being out being a cheerleader for privatizing Social Security or being you know voting multiple times for this Ryan budget that would end Medicare as we know it. Is it's it's short sighted about the things we need to make sure that our seniors are protected. These are these are promises we made to our seniors and ourselves and. And frankly, we're, there are promises we need to keep. And this, this is plan is not tweaking the system. This is this is really an extreme, <laughs> extreme change. This is ending the program. This is ending Medicare. What they yeah. want to do. Okay. So uh, let's switch to a, a different topic, okay. uh, but in the same general area, uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, which uh, opponents call uh, Obamacare, but that uh, doesn't seem to bother President Obama. He, he said he does care. <laughs> He does care, which is why he has the Affordable Care Act. Uh, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, uh, how was the financial solvency of uh, Medicare affected? Yeah, well, I mean, the the, the solvency of the of the programs actually got better. We, we we're going to have the, those programs established longer and solvent for a longer period of time. And and frankly, the the reverse is true if we have, if we repeal the, those laws. Mm -hmm. And yeah, actually, uh, yeah, the uh, Medicare fund was. Uh, was was extended for seven years un, un, under under that yeah and if, and if uh, Affordable Care Act is repealed, then it's going to go backwards seven years and we're going to have a m much more immediate crisis of Medicare. You know, we still have to look at Medicare, but the uh, you know, Affordable Care Act bought us seven years uh, right. in which to examine it and to uh, and to to see what can what what can work to uh, to, to, to have it have it continue. So in the uh, Affordable Care Act, there's something called an individual mandate. Uh, what, what, what is it and why, why is it necessary? Sure. Well, the, the uh, individual mandate is essentially a program that requires people who are, well, everyone, but especially people who are healthy to buy into the system. Mm -hmm. um, in order for a risk pool to work on an insurance basis, you have to have not just the sick people in the program, yeah. But also some healthy people who uh, some you know will have access to the health care too. Um, they don't use as much health care, and so as a result, they um, they actually you know help balance out the co folks on the other end who are very sick who are mm -hmm. using a lot of health care. And essentially, what the Affordable Care Act did with the individual mandate is it said we're going to make sure everyone's covered, and then in exchange for that, we're going to make sure that we've got some really good benefits, like making sure that people with pre-existing conditions uh, can still get health care, not just uh, after the not just now, but going forward, they'll be able to get access even if they've lost coverage already. Uh, make sure that we can close the donut hole in the Medicare Part D program, making sure that uh, kids can stay on their health insurance until they turn 26. Uh, and that's the trade-off, is that folks have to actually do it. Now, it's necessary because otherwise, people would wait to buy insurance until they were yeah. sick. Um, and if you do that, then the rest of the program just can't fund itself. And so uh, I was not a big fan of the individual mandate. I'll confess that. I, I think that... Uh, it was questionable under the Commerce Clause. But I do think uh, we've got to have a system going forward that it gets more coverage for more people, and that, that I was happy with. Okay, you made mention of the donut hole. Uh, which, could you just talk about that for a minute or so? Sure. Well, when the Medicare Part D program was put into place, uh, there was a, a, a piece of uh, funding that was not put in place with it. And so essentially you had coverage for a certain period of time, and then you had no coverage for a while, and then you got covered again. And the idea, I think, was essentially that People who use a little bit, everyone will be covered. And then if you were you know, hit a catastrophic event where you needed Medicare uh, to cover uh, drugs going forward, you'd be able to get that. But we had this essentially a donut hole where there was no coverage. And the Affordable Care Act starts closing that hole. Um, I think seniors will be uh, pretty concerned if there was a repeal of the Affordable Care Act and the, the $500 or $1,000 that they've gotten extra money to make sure they can afford their prescriptions is lost because these guys want to repeal it, including my opponent, John Klein. And one of the cruel things about the donut hole is that you still had to pay premiums for, for zero coverage. Right, during that window of time, yeah, right. During that window of time. Anyways, that, that whole, uh, there's a phase out program uh, that goes over I don't know, four, five, six years. Uh, 
to close that donut hole fully. So, right. So, okay. Uh, also included in the Affordable Health Care Act uh, are health exchanges, uh, which is supposed to help people. Uh, can you explain what that is? Sure. Well, I mean, one of the things, it, these will be state-run programs primarily. Um, as long as the states put a play, one in place, the federal government will kind of just stay out of the game a little bit. Um, but the, the idea being they have a, pl a place where a person can go